as Toronto's tiny, perfect mayor. Easily the most charming politician of his generation, but for me, he will always remain the summer replacement host on the city show. Thank you, Moses. Uh, first of all, let me, uh, I, on behalf of all of you, thank the Moses and Richard and all the people who put this together. I've had just a mind-stretching, thoroughly enjoyable couple of days. I have to admit, like most of you, or at least some of you, this old head was uh, found, uh, found itself being uh, mysticized and, and, and somehow uh, not necessarily catching all of the acronyms, all of the concepts, some of them went right by me. But I was, in fact, I was commiserating a little with, uh, with Adam Vaughn, who's a journalist here with City TV, an excellent journalist. And it reminded him, he said, of, of a Marshall McLuhan story. It happens to be a true story, which is even better. Uh, Marshall McLuhan lived up in the, in the Toronto neighborhood of Witchwood Park, where Colin was raised, or where uh, Adam was raised. And uh, he used to drive a long black car down to St. Mike's in his office. And he loved his black car and he loved his parking space. One day he drives in and the long black, and there's a, another long black car, not his, in his space. So he left a little note, put it in the windshield, and he said in the note, this is my space. I would thank you not to use it again. And he signed it, Marshall McLuhan. The next day he comes back, the space is open, but when he comes back out of the office to go home, there's a note on his windshield. Picks up, the, picks up the note and reads it, and the note says, thank you. This is the first time I've ever understood anything you've ri written. <laughs> My own story that I'd like to talk about a little bit today uh, began about 16 years ago. Um, at that time, the, a new... Uh, Prime Minister had been uh, elected in, 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 uh, in Ottawa, Brian <laughs> Freudian slip, uh, in, in Ottawa, and uh, his name was Brian Mulroney. Uh, and I, you would not know this, but I had not supported his leadership bid uh, for our party. And there was some speculation, certainly in my own household, but I think in other places, whether or not I would be asked to join the cabinet, uh, and indeed if I was, what that position would be. Uh, and, and, of course, as you know, when a Prime Minister of Canada uh, puts in a new cabinet, he looks around the table of those who are available to him, and by, uh, by their background, their training, their education, uh, he tries to fit those in who are best fitted for the job that he wants to give them. Of course, I'm from downtown Toronto all of my life, and I was an absolutely perfect candidate for being the Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs. Uh, so, uh, so, I... Uh, I, I have to tell you, my knowledge of the, of the portfolio was meager at best, and so I decided that I would then try and find out what I ought to be doing. I have to tell you that um, if, if having a good time, enjoying yourself, and learning uh, is the best revenge, I found it to be so, because I spent the next three years on a journey which I'd, I have not yet finished. A journey which has taken me back to my home base, but which I still involve myself in. Because I knew nothing, I spent the next three years living with Aboriginal people, spending an enormous amount of time in the circumpolar world. I went through the 10, 10 time zones of, uh, of uh, the Soviet Union, from Moscow over to Providenia, with uh, Aboriginal people, spending time in with Chukchi people in, Yuk in, in Yakutsk, in the, in, in the central site in central Siberia. I spent time uh, with Sami people uh, in Norway. I spent time uh, in Nuuk and Yakutavan and Greenland. It was an, and I have spent time, of course, with some on some 300 Aboriginal communities in, in Canada. Um, in order to help me understand, I not only try to talk to people and learn. I read. I read treaties. I 
read histories. I never thought I would. It was an enormous blessing. One of the books I read was a book by uh, Hugh Brody. Now, I don't, those of you who know the Arctic or spend time there or pay attention to it, Hugh Brody normally writes about the Arctic. He's an Englishman. But he wrote a wonderful book called Maps and Dreams. You can find it in the library. It's a little thin volume. It's about, uh, now I guess about 16, 17, 18 years old. It's uh, not a story about the Arctic. It's a story about the beaver people. The beaver people are Aboriginal people who live in the central interior of the province of British Columbia. They've been there for centuries. In the book, he tries to explain what's important about the beaver people, what's important to the beaver people, and how they've conducted their both individual and collective lives over these many centuries. <laughs> About every 15 or 16 pages in the book, you will find these squiggly kind of uh, spaghetti-like maps. These maps are basically the biographic and community maps of survival of the beaver people. They don't write them down, they're in their head, they're biographic maps. And it tells them, these maps, it tells them in their head where the game is, where the fish can be found, where shelter can be obtained, where the enemy might be, might be, where comfort can be found, where other members can be found. They have in their both collective and individual heads these maps. They are the cultural, economic, and environmental survival maps of the beaver people. I kept that understanding in my head up a couple of years ago. It became useful again. I was asked if I would, about four or five years ago, if I would go down to Santa Fe, New Mexico, to talk about cultural identities. Uh, this is a sort of post-NAFTA uh, try and understand Mexicans and Americans and Canadians all came together in Santa Fe to talk about what we could exchange in terms of cultural uh, and linguistic identities. And while I was, we finished the, 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 the conference, we were asked to write a chapter uh, on our understanding of cultural identities and what we could offer to one another to understand. Uh, I, I'm not a very good writer. I find writing very, very hard. Uh, so I, I would write out a chapter, and I'd send it down to this man at Stanford University who was putting the book together. Uh, and uh, he would send it back saying, no, no, no. This is not it. That's not, that's not what you said. So, so do it again in a nice professorial way. Uh, so I would write it back, send it down again. Finally, he phoned, and he said, David, you're from Toronto. You have secrets about how your city works. Share those secrets. And he said, I've enclosed a book that might help you. And so I read another book. I, I've read more than two, but I've read another book. <laughs> uh, read another book, and the book he read, and you may know this one. It's called, it was it's by Robert Putnam, called Making Democracy Work. It's a book about, well, it's a book, it's supposed to be a book about understanding regional government in Italy. <laughs> Um, I can tell you, when you read it in the subway, you're all alone. Uh, there's no, no one has a fighting interest in regional government in, 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 in Italy. It's, it's not even the Italians, I, I gather. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, what's remarkable about the book is, is, is that it's got very little to do at the end of the day with understanding the forms of regional government. It's really got to do with understanding what makes places, cities, provinces, regional areas tick. What's really fundamental about the various parts of Italy, the, I think there's 16 regions, why is it that some regions did well and are doing well, others have not presented very often with the same set of circumstances, certainly differently, some doing better than others. Why? And he went through the various possible reasons. Is it money? Is it training? Is it education? And it goes through it all. He, all of those are important. He says, but the really most important thing is their, their civic capacity for understanding their own heritage, their own roots, their own, in a sense, their own municipal DNA, their understanding of who they are so that when in times of rapid change, you can suck up out of your own roots 
the things you need in order to deal with these things as you try and accommodate to rapid change. I, that was a lesson I joined with my lesson from, from, uh, uh, from Hugh Brody, that cities around the world, and I want to talk about the city. This is the city part of TED City. Uh, and the impact of TED on cities. Because all cities today, city regions, are going through the redevelopment, the reorganization, the, the construction of new survival maps, economic survival maps, environmental survival maps, spiritual survival maps, etc. All cities are different. They have their own different starting points. They have a different heritage and culture. So their responses to TED, to the new economy, to all of the things that we've been talking about over the last couple of days, are going to change. But there has been in the past 40 years, 30, 50, last generation or two, a quickening of the pace of change. Anne Golden, in a very thoughtful presentation yesterday, talked about uh, the tipping point, that things slowly gather and then they quicken. And then all of a sudden the change is upon you. And we're going through that, that now. We've been going through it in every city, in every city region around the globe. Now, you don't see it every day. It, it's sort of, because you go through your life on a day-by-day -day basis. People don't actually see rapid change because it's difficult. But you, you're going through it at, at, at any rate. I mean, the people, the people who lived uh, in the Renaissance, you may, you may, this may be surprising to you, they didn't know it. They didn't know they were living in the Renaissance. People who lived in the Middle Ages didn't know that either. No one got up in the morning and said, good morning, Frank. Are you enjoying the Middle Ages today? No one, no one did that. It was only later on they explained it all to us what had actually gone on as we plodded through all of those changes and tried to cope with them all. That's what we're doing today. Now, all the cities, as I say, are, have a different approach because of who they are and where they came from, just like the regions of Italy. But they are going to have to touch on, each of them, some very important things if they are going to make their own survival maps work for them. I know Toronto reasonably well, so I can talk about Toronto. I can't talk about Kuala Lumpur. I have family in, in Hamilton for my sins, so I understand a little bit about Hamilton. I joke. I saw Herman Turtsko over there, and I thought he'd throw in Hamilton. Nothing to do with the story. Uh, just Herman, good to see you. Uh, uh, at any rate, uh, pick, as I go through the next minute or two, pick the things that you remember about your own place. But every one of them is going to have to touch on these five things. And I'll be fairly quick. Politicians always use no more than five points. Because that's the length of the hand. It's a very simple concept. Uh, uh, at any rate, first, there has, of course, been enormous change in the economy of every city. This city, any city, any city region in the world has been going through the last 40 or 50 years an enormous change in its basic economy, how it manufactures wealth. I could take you a mile that way and take you to the Canadian National Exhibition, look north, and there you would have seen 45 years ago, you would have seen 30,000 jobs, manufacturing jobs, Massey Ferguson, farm, farm machinery of the world, et cetera, et cetera. They're all gone. And that's happened in every major city. The important thing to understand is that we've gone this way before, when the railroads came, when they came to Toronto and they came to all the cities of the world, they transformed those cities, transformed this city. They changed our sense of time, our sense of place, changed our education system, changed our social structure, changed our attitudes towards life when the railroads came. And they're changing after they left. And with the new communication technology, the same thing is happening again. What you have to do, of course, if you're looking for a survival map, is understand 
that you need to seize the opportunity, invest where you can, do not be stopped by borders and boundaries unless they're in your interest to do so. I once asked uh, Garth Drabinsky, uh, he doesn't like the Olympics apparently, uh, Garth Drabinsky, uh, my old friend, old friend, uh, Garth Drabinsky, what's your economic map of Toronto? He said, I don't know. But he says, I know it includes Connecticut and New York. Uh, so we need to understand that our, the limit of our economic survival map is the limit of our imagination and our energy. Not just an economic map, but cities, this city, other cities around the world, are increasingly having to rediscover their relationship with nature. There have been a number of people who made presentations on this already. It is an obvious point now. It wasn't so obvious 40 years ago. The very first two minutes? <laughs> metric, we'll do metric. Two minutes and metric. That's three, okay, I'll do it fast then. Sorry, I'm enjoying myself. Uh, but it is important to understand that, that we have spent the last 40 years reteaching ourselves the role of nature in the city. And it comes down to this. This is the, the litany that all cities are having to rediscover. Everything is connected to everything else. Bob Hunter tells you that. Everything is connected to everything else. Human beings are part of nature, not separate from it. And therefore, we're respons for responsible for the consequences of the actions we take. We're responsible to ourselves, to other people, to other species, to other generations. And therefore, the idea that you can move in, use up, or throw away, and move on is no longer possible. Three, I have to hurry. Three, we're going to have to, we are rediscovering the importance of community and place making. Places are not, in cities, are not simply physical spaces. Places are psychic spaces. They are places where the human personality is developed and nurtured and grows. The most cosmic questions that individuals have to ask themselves when they're born and to the die. Who am I? How do I behave? Where do I belong? Those are the questions that are best found in small places and small spaces. And therefore, placemaking and design of placemaking is fundamental to the community survival map of the city of the 21st century. Four, there's only one more Morris, or uh, Morris, flip the camera. One more Moses. Four, we, we have to remember that one of the great virtues of this city and some others, but certainly this city, has been a social peace, which we have benefited from for many, many generations. We don't get it by having more cops. If we remember an ancient, very, uh, not so ancient, but an old, Quaker maxim, that social peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the growing presence of social justice and equity to the people who are members. That's what makes communities work and have social peace. And finally, finally if I could, the last one is as important as all the others, but it's in a sense less coherent because it's more individual. Almost everybody was really impressed, not even how techy the presentations got. People leaned it towards the end of them on some sense of spirituality. Uh, the project of city building is daily. You can't do it all in one swoop. And so therefore, you should always remember, as, as our good friend Doug Cardinal was saying yes, last night, it is important that we make sure that we understand it as a spiritual enterprise as well. You will find your own path for that. I was lucky. I was lucky as a very young man, and I had Martin Buber whisper in my ear three words. Hallow the everyday. Hallow the everyday, he said. Not to me personally, I was reading it, but I felt the whisper in my ear. Hallow the everyday. Not just every day you should seize as an important thing and a gift to you, that's true. But more importantly, his deeper message to me was, you have to make divine 
what is ordinary. Somebody yesterday, I think it was, uh, could have been, uh, Royce, don't know, said, quoted uh, Spinoza's great insight that, that uh, 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 freedom comes from recognizing necessity. Well, there is also no, no doubt that there, the importance of recognizing that everyday things need to be divine. That's the root of making sure that you're going to pay attention to all of the other survival maps. That was also the message of Doug Cardinal last night. Thanks very much.